Well, welcome back to our Life Group video sessions. We are still studying uh, the book of Isaiah. I always want to remind you of the two aspects of prophetic literature in the Bible, uh, foretelling or messages addressing the concerns of the prophet's own time, and foretelling is prophetic messages that reveal future events. And as we say every week, always remember the themes that we see through the book of Isaiah, God's sovereignty and the Holy One of Israel and servanthood. So also every week I like to go over what we've studied. So let's see where we've been. We talked about God confronting His people with the sins and their evil ways. Uh, we saw that God sends messengers for His people. In this case, the messenger was Isaiah. We saw that God promises things to His people. And it's important that we trust Him to keep those promises. We saw that God reigns over everything and everybody. Uh, we looked at God and how He saves His people. He has a sovereign plan to save us. Uh, we saw that how God protects His people. We saw that God hears His people when we pray. And then we also saw last week about God renewing His people and provides strength for those who trust Him. Uh, so what we're going to do today is look at chapter 46. And, and in today's study, we're going to see how God acts. A-C-T-S, how He does action. He has a plan and he is, committed that, he is committed to that plan and to taking action to move that plan forward. But before we get there, we studied chapter 40 last week. Let's see if we can build a little short bridge from Isaiah 40 to Isaiah 46. So um, in, the, in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah... Uh, Isaiah introduces the concept of the servant of the Lord. And while there are no specific identity spelled out in that chapter, Matthew 12, verses 17 through 21 tells us that Jesus fulfilled the predicted role of that servant. Uh, Isaiah 42 also contains a collection of messages that emphasize God's power and righteousness in calling the people of Israel into a covenant relationship. When you move on to Isaiah 43, it focuses on the Lord's promise to redeem His covenant people after purifying them from their sins. Uh, Isaiah chapter 44 shows God promising to pour out his, spe his Spirit on His people. It focuses on God's condemnation of idolatry. It exposes the senseless and danger, sense senselessness and danger of idolatry. And it returned to the theme of restoration. And then that theme of restoration flows over into Isaiah 45, where Isaiah once again stresses that God's supreme power and, declare, and he declared that the Lord is going to bring salvation to his people. So all that said brings us to chapter 46, where God encourages his people to trust that he would accomplish his plans. And so what we're going to see here, three descriptions of God as he acts to fulfill uh, his purposes. One of them is the, the true God. Uh, the second one is the trustworthy one. And then the third one is the just one. Uh, Isaiah contrasted the eternal God of Israel to the idols representing Babylon's false gods. And uh, the Lord could carry out his purposes and rescue his people, but these idols should only stand motionless and powerless and silent. Uh, so let's read... Um, it, our, 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 your curriculum actually starts in verse 3, but we're going to begin uh, in verse 1 and go ahead and read all of those verses. So let's look at verses 1 through 7 together. Um, it says that, uh, Bel and Nebo, the gods of Babylon, bow as they are lowered to the ground. They are being hauled away on ox carts. Uh, the poor beasts stra stagger under the weight. Both idols and their owners uh, bow down. The gods cannot compare, can, the gods cannot protect the people, and the people cannot protect the gods. They go off into captivity together. Listen to me, descendants of Jacob, all you who reign in Israel. I have cared for you since you were born. Yes, I carried you before you were born. I will be your God throughout your lifetime. And until your hair is, gray, is white with age, I made you, and I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Some people pour out their silver and gold and hire craftsmen to make a god from it. They bow down and they worship it. They carry it around on their shoulders and when they set it down, it stays there. It can't even move. And when someone prays to it, there is no answer. It cannot rescue anyone from trouble. Isaiah begins here in this passage by providing a kind of, kind of sad look at the gods of Babylon. 
He says things like, like I'd be moved and carried around by people. Uh, they don't have any power to protect the people. Uh, it, it, it's really kind of an interesting picture of what it's like to worship a man-made item. And, and then after those couple of verses at the beginning, Isaiah begins to paint a completely different picture. He said, listen, pay attention to this because it's very, very important. And he paints a picture of, of being cared for. He paints a picture of, of being carried when we need to be carried. It, it's a picture of in, an eternal commitment of caring. He said, since you were born, but not, not only since you were born, since before you were born, not just for your lifetime. This is an eternal commitment to his people. Uh, in those verses, he gives three specific promises. I want you to look at them there. He says, I will care for you. Now, that's important, caring. He says, I'll carry you along. And he also says that I will save you. This is what God provides. And consequently, it's also the thing that man-made idols cannot actually provide. And, and then there are some questions that are similar to the ones asked in some previous chapters. He says, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Of course, we know that as people of God, these questions are obvious. They have an obvious answer. Uh, the questions demonstrate how, how foolish it is to consider that anything, anywhere compares to God. Sometimes we all need to be reminded of how great God really is. And then again, as he moves out of, um, out of the first few verses, again what we see is, um, is a sad reality that people in Isaiah's day chose to worship idols uh, instead of God. We, once again, we see the, the silliness of this and, and, and why this is not realistic. I mean, he, he talks about the idols and he says um, they needed to use existing idols and needed a creator to form these things. And then and, and the idol had to be carried around everywhere they went. And, and when they set it down, it just had to stay put there. And so he pointed out some things that, um, that were pretty obvious. When they prayed to the idol, nothing happened. And it didn't have any power to rescue anyone from, from anything. And, and, Isaiah, and part of what Isaiah said, in other words, what he's saying here is, What's the point of the idol? It didn't do anything. You've got to carry it around. It, you, it can't save you. You've got to save it. And so there's simply no other God than the one true God. And, and that's what the people needed to remember. That's one of the things that, that had to be a focus. If God was to be trustworthy, uh, God is the only one, the only God. And He, he, is, he is one that... Uh, he's one that, that can protect. He is one um, that can take care of us. He, he's one that can act on our behalf. And so we moved on to trustworthy. I've always liked it when someone called me trustworthy. I don't know why. I, I think it's one of the highest compliments that someone can, can receive. You are trustworthy. That, that's a good thing. God is always trustworthy. Um, in the next verses, he, he talks about uh, Isaiah uh, refers to, to, um, to the trustworthiness of God and, and how tr trustworthy God is. Let's, uh, let's look at these next verses. Let's look at verses um, 8, 8 through 11. Isaiah says, Do not forget this. Keep it in mind. Remember this, you guilty ones. Remember the things I've done in the past. For I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. I'll call a swift bird of prey from the east, a leader from the distant land to come and do my bidding. I have said what I would do, and I will do it, he says. God always keeps his promises. Remember that. Let's look at this verse by verse. Look at verse 8. God called his people the guilty ones here, uh, probably because... They knew what God wanted them to do, and yet they consistently chose not to do those things. We do that sometimes, don't we? He implored the people, remember these things. Keep them in mind. 
it, it's more than a mere mental reflection on days gone by. This is the act of bringing things to mind with the intent that action is going to be taken. And so God wanted His people to be courageous and He needed them to show bold obedience in the light of the truth that He was going to share with them. So, so verse 8, uh, He talks about, um, He calls them the guilty ones, but He says, I want you to pay attention. Look at this really closely. Uh, verse 9, He repeated the uh, instruction that the people remember. Remember the things I've done in the past. Once again, He's saying, Bring something to mind with the purpose of acting on that. Uh, remember what happened. Remember what's happened in the past. Remember the things that I have done for Israel, the, the ways I have taken care of them. God encourages the people to remember who God is, what He has done, and how important it is to follow Him. They needed to remember that God always does what He says He will do. When we move into verse 10, Isaiah demonstrates the, the uniqueness of God. He talks about knowing future events before they ever happen. He talks about the ability to ensure that my plans are successful. Uh, he says that God says, I will succeed in whatever plan I make. Those are unique things. But it's a message, too, that God is trustworthy enough to do everything that He says He will do. When we move down into verse 11, in this verse, there are specifics about how God is going to rescue His people. He says, I'm going to bring a bird of prey. God plans to overthrow the Babylonian Empire by using a vengeful instrument from somewhere else. Look what He says there. He says that it's going to come from the east that it will be from a distant land. And again, he reiterates the idea that God keeps his word. I will do what I said I would do. Knowing all of these things should have given the people in exile every confidence in their future deliverance. And so he's not only the true God. He's not only, he's not only the trustworthy one. But God is also the just one. In, in these final verses in Isaiah 46, God returned to a command that, that He had used before. Let's look at this. He says in verse 12, Listen to me, you stubborn people who are so far from doing right, for I am ready to set things right, not in the distant future, but right now. I am ready to save Jerusalem and show my glory to Israel. The people here are reminded again. They need to think back to the past. Uh, this is a reminder. He says, um, listen to me, you stubborn people. There is a reminder they are stubborn people who choose not to follow God. They chose the path of disobedience. Uh, he referred to them as, as individuals who have strayed far from what they should have been doing. The people had a, a lack of righteousness because they refused to take God at His word. It says, um, uh, this translation says, uh, far from doing right. Your translation, your translation might say far from righteousness. They were far from righteousness, from being right with God because they're their hard hearts had simply refused to believe that God could be taken at His word. And God says this. This is Brother House translation, not from your script. She says, things are about to change now. He said, the day was coming when deliverance and restoration would put an end to the exile. He said, that day's not far away either. He said, it... it it's not coming way in the future. It's coming sooner than you think it is. God is getting ready to move in some very powerful ways for these people. Um, I want you to look closely what he said here. Not only are the captives going to return, not only would his 
captive people return. The city of Jerusalem and the temple are going to be rebuilt. God's glorious presence is going to once again be manifested in the place where he promised to make his name dwell. God's presence would be in Israel and Israel would reflect God's splendor because he would deliver them from Babylon. And one of the big things he says in here, the last verse, I will show my glory to Israel. God would receive the glory. So as we look at this chapter, and all these things that, that, that Isaiah tells us, all the things that were going, going on in, in chapter 46, we need to understand if God is going to act and he's going to take action to make his plan and have his plan work. There are some characteristics that make that. He's, tr he's the true God. He's the only one that could do that. If you couldn't know that, I couldn't do it. None of us could. God is trustworthy. He does everything that he says he would do, and he is just. And so every week we're talking about lessons that we can learn. And like I say every week, I hope you're still reading these and finding lessons uh, that you can learn that will... Um, that you can put to work in, in your everyday life. And so what, what are some of the things we learn here? Well, one of the things that, that we can learn out of, this, out of chapter 46 is uh, God is worthy of our faithfulness and attention because He's a living God. N none of these things that uh, we put our faith in, none of these, th these physical things, man-made things that, that we put our trust in, none of those are worthy. God is worthy of our faithfulness because He's a living God. He is capable of having a relationship with us. You can't have a relationship with your money. You can't have a relationship with your car. Well, some might argue that, but God can have a relationship with us. Man-made idols can't do that, okay? Another thing that we can learn here is God is always trustworthy. Now, that may, may be more of a reminder to us than something we learn, but it's a good lesson to remember. God's always trustworthy. He always does what He said He'll do. And our problem sometimes is that He may not work in our timing. He may not do it at the speed that we want Him to do it. But He always keeps His promises. He always does what He says He'll do. The third thing I think we can learn here is that we should consistently think about what God has done and how those things spur us to ministry. I think we should all be thinking about what our ministry, what, what, what are we going to do in ministry? What can we do to accomplish God's purposes here on earth? We should be consistently thinking what God has done for us in the past, what He's done for His people, or maybe not just us personally. And then the last thing I think we can see, and, and there, are other, there are other lessons you can learn here. I'm just putting four of them out there. What God does through us should always bring glory to Him. It should never bring glory to us. If, if, we're doing, if we do any ministry thing and we want to get glory out of it, that's, that's not what God intended it to be. When God does something through us, He should always get the glory for that. It's important. It's very important. So um, I hope that you're still seeing things that you can apply to, to your lives and to, to everyone's to just a practical application for you. I hope all of us are seeing those things. Next week, we're going to go over to Isaiah 49. What we're going to see in Isaiah 49 is how God comforts. The one true God is compassionate and, co and comforts His people. That's what we're going to find in Isaiah 49. So I'm going to pray for us before I do. I want to remind you, prayer with no intermission, the Bible study, Sunday, November 1st is session 5 of our study with Pastor Bill Elliff. These sessions will be uh, streamed on Facebook on Sunday evenings at 6, and of course they're available on YouTube, and then they're available on church websites. So you can go back and look at any of those. Uh, I re always remember digital. We're not here meeting at the church. Um, prayer with no intermission, the 40-day focus. Day 1 was Monday, October 5th. So Monday, October 2nd is day 29, if you're following along. And then, of course, want to remember the 150th anniversary celebrations. Uh, Pastor Bill Elliff will be here on November 15th for our final 150-year celebration, and that happens to be Shoebox Dedication Sunday. So continue filling the shoeboxes, and when Pastor Bill Elliff is here, we will celebrate 
Uh, we'll celebrate prayer and we'll pray for these shoe boxes uh, before they begin to, to move across the world. Sunday and Wednesday activities uh, remain the same as they have. So I'm excited about uh, continuing Isaiah. We've got a few more weeks left before we finish the book. And um, keep remembering week after week that we want to uh, find things that God can apply to our lives today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for being trustworthy. Thank you for being just. Thank you for being the one true God. And Father, we thank you for acting on our behalf and acting on behalf of your people. Father, help us to learn things, continually learn things when we dig into your word. In your name we pray. Amen.